Good morning and welcome to Sophie Ridge on Sunday. It had seemed like the moment of maximum danger for the Prime Minister had passed. Sue Gray's report into partying at Downing Street was published on Wednesday to only a trickle of criticism from Conservative backbenchers. But that trickle could be turning into a steadier stream and there are rumours that we could reach the 54-letter threshold that would trigger a confidence vote in the Prime Minister. At this point, Boris Johnson would be feeling pretty confident he would win that vote, but remember, two difficult by-elections are around the corner and a YouGov poll has suggested that if there was an election today, the Conservatives would hang on to just three of 88 battleground constituencies. If there's one thing that could push MPs into action, it's the thought of losing their seat. Well, in a moment for the government, we'll be joined by Northern Ireland Secretary Brandon Lewis. For Labour, we'll be speaking to the party's chair and shadow women and equality secretary, Annalise Dodds. We'll be looking at food price inflation and just how hard it is for those on the lowest incomes with Iceland's managing director, Richard Walker. Rail unions are threatening to bring the country to a standstill and that could be a sign of more strikes to come. We'll be talking to the RMT general secretary, Mick Lynch. And I am delighted to say that I'm going to be joined live here in the studio by the Ukrainian MP, Kira Rudik, who's been in the UK meeting politicians here. Hello, good morning. Well, just ahead of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, the government is hoping to focus on its policy to bring back imperial measures. Could we see crowns back on pint pots? But of course, the talk here in Westminster remains about the Prime Minister's future and those allegations of interference in Sugro's report are going to be particularly unhelpful for Number 10, as more Conservative MPs make it clear they want him to go. Well, we're joined now by the Northern Ireland Secretary, Brandon Lewis. Thank you very much for being uh, with us. Um, it's been a pretty difficult week uh, for the government with the publication of the Sue Gray report. Um, you've come out to back for the government not once but twice. I also interviewed you on Wednesday, the day of the publication. Yes, yes, I was at Hillsborough Castle. I was just awaiting the uh, arrival of the US delegation to uh, come have dinner and talk about the issues with the Northern Ireland Protocol and uh, Northern Ireland more generally. You've got a bit of a history though, haven't you, of coming out to bat for the government on these really difficult days. And I remember talking to you after Matt Hancock had been caught breaking COVID rules, after Mark Rashford's free school meal policy. I mean, you're hoping that Number 10 will, might one day let you out when there's a good news story to talk about. <laughs> well, actually, this week is, a, is an example, actually. We have quite a lot, a lot of work going on this week. Actually, in Northern Ireland, we've had the second reading of a very, very important, delicate but important uh, piece of legislation. So it's been a busy week all round. I'm always happy to come out and uh, talk about what we're doing in government because we're focused on delivering for people and getting the job done uh, in a way that works for people across the UK. OK. Well, of course, it's you know just four days since you were uh, speaking uh, here uh, to me. But even in those four days, we've had more allegations coming out around the publication of the Sue Gray report uh, into... Uh, partying in Downing Street during lockdown. Now, according to the Sunday Times, I just want to go through what's in the Sunday Times today because it does feel quite significant. On the night before her report, she was apparently lobbied to make changes to it. This is the Sunday Times. Simon Case, the Cabinet Secretary, Samantha Jones, the Permanent Secretary at Number 10, and Alex Chisholm, the Permanent Secretary to the Cabinet Office, are understood to have pressed Gray to water down her conclusions. They go on to say... Sources said that Case's, na <clears throat> sorry, Case's name was among those they wanted to remove. Other changes were requested to sections of the report referring to the Prime Minister's wife, Carrie. Is that true? Uh, I, I don't recognise any of that. And look, I've got, I've got to say, we've had a police investigation into all of these issues now. They've come to their conclusions, made their decisions. And we've had Sue Gray. And I, think, I, I don't think anybody would question the independence and the probability of either the police and I certainly I have to say as I said to you on Wednesday having worked with Sue Gray in her previous roles and my previous roles I wouldn't I wouldn't in any way question Sue Gray's independence and determination to deliver a report that she is comfortable it is a full and complete report which is what she's done you say you don't recognize this what does that mean I don't what does that mean I don't recognize uh, well look nobody has said anything of the sort to me that that reflects what was, what the times of uh, you've just outlined from the but, times but with there, respect so. though no, no one's saying that they were lobbying you to try and change the no 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 that the allegation is that very senior people including Simon Case the cabinet secretary 
were directly trying to influence the report. But as I say, having worked with Sue Gray in other areas and actually in her current, not on the report, but in her role as uh, dealing with union issues and things like that, uh, if Sue Gray wasn't comfortable, she wouldn't be putting the report out. She has put a report out that she is comfortable with. She's an independently minded as well as doing this in an independent kind of capacity and a very professional civil servant. So I, I don't believe that anybody, and knowing Sue Gray, I don't believe anybody would be able to pressure Sue Gray into putting any kind of report out that she wasn't comfortable with the, I think the full and proper report. The problem is, you say you know Sue Gray. I don't know Sue Gray. <coughs> no, no, I've never met her. That, yeah. Our viewers don't know Sue, Sue Gray. We're just supposed to be taking this on trust. Uh, well, no, no, you can go further than that because don't forget, it's not just the Sue Gray report. We've also had the police investigation. The police have come to and they find Boris Johnson well. for breaking the law. Yeah, they they find the Prime Minister for one one. one what, so issue that's actually the, quite good then. So no, no, no. We're no, now being I'm told not, that actually. I'm not that's saying it's good. good. Look, look, this, this, there's no denying this whole situation is not good. It shouldn't have happened. That's why the Prime Minister, I think, was right to go out and apologise for that. I have to say there were things in that report. Uh, were reported we spoke briefly about earlier in the week around how some of the security and cleaning staff were treated. It was abhorrent. Nobody should be treated like that. You're one team working together for the benefit of the country. Whatever your role in it is, it's an important part. People should be treated with respect. I Do think that's why it's I... good that this report was done and we're able to now deal with the issues and the Prime Minister's already taken on board the recommendations from the interim report and, as the final report notes, is putting those changes into place. Has, the, has anyone managed to identify who those people were who were supposed to be abusing the staff? Yeah, I have said not as far as I'm aware. I know the Prime Minister's gone and personally apologised uh, to the staff for what they suffered, but I'm, I, I don't think anybody's aware of exactly who has committed that in the first place. But we've got to be clear, that kind of behaviour, that kind of attitude towards anybody is completely unacceptable. As I say, we're all working together. Whatever your role so within the government, happen, you then? are part of delivering for do, the do, government. Do you think that those people should be found and then sacked? Well, that's something the civil service themselves and, and number 10, I, I know, will be looking at to, to get to the bottom of what happened. But I think the important thing is that those, t those people who are treated that way know that the senior management there, the Prime Minister, who is himself obviously the, lead, um, the leader there of not just our party but of, of, of Number 10 in the government, has made it very clear it's not acceptable and has apologised to them personally for how they've been treated. Um, one of the things that um, I was a bit puzzled about, I said on Wednesday as well, uh, is the fact that Sue Gray didn't investigate the alleged Abernite party uh, in the Number 10 flat. That was on November the 13th, 2020. This is the Sunday Times this morning and they're talking again about the alleged pressure on Sue Gray. Another key passage to be altered concerned the alleged Abernite party in the Prime Minister's flat above Downing Street on November the 13th, 2020. An earlier draft of the report referred to music being played, and then it goes on <coughs> to say... According to two sources, Stephen Barclay, Johnson's chief of staff, tweaked it on the eve of the report's publication, a claim denied by Downing Street. So... What's going on there? Was there any tweaking, if you like, of that? Well, look, I'd say, again, uh, a couple of key points. First of all, obviously, this is another situation the police looked at and people were not I'm finding, didn't find the issue. No, yeah, I know you're asking about the Sue Gray report, but, but there is an important fact here. The number, number 10 down the street are saying that this claim is, is not correct, that it's, that it's untrue, and I would say that's backed up by the fact that the police didn't see anything there that required anybody being fined. So... Um, I, I think the Downing Street statement is a, is a fair statement. The problem about the Downing Street statement, if I'm going to level with you, is that Downing Street have apologised for lying or misleading journalists about Partygate, right? You know, the Prime Minister's spokesman had to issue an apology saying there were failures in both what happened and how it was handled subsequently, and he apologised for that. So how can we trust what Downing Street is saying? It's a bit like the boy who cried, cried wolf. Well, a couple of things. Again, I think, look, first of all, it's a different Downing Street. You've got a different team of people. The Chief of Staff is different. Uh, the Prime Minister's the same. Yeah, Prime Minister, but, but the team that you're talking about, the team that worked with the Prime Minister, that lead on these issues, and Steve Barclay himself is new and wasn't there at the time of those original uh, mistakes and issues happened. But on top of that, it's not just Downing Street um, denying it. We've also got a situation where the police have looked at this, this uh, particular set of incidents and didn't find an issue there to find people. Can you come on this programme and give us an, an assurance, a black and white assurance, that nobody in Downing Street, in Number 10, or in the civil service tried to influence the Sue Gray report? I, I'm absolutely confident that's the case. Look, I wasn't part of the report, I'm not part of the Number 10 team that worked with Sue Gray on the report, but as I said, and I appreciate your point about the general public don't know Sue Gray, but those who have worked with Sue Gray across government, both people who... But the um, question isn't about whether uh, the report uh, uh, well, was influenced, say, it was about whether that influence no, I, was attempted. Yeah, no, I understand that, but as I say, anybody who's working Number 10 knows Sue Gray well enough to know that that kind of okay. thing wouldn't work, and no, I'm confident, and particularly now I'm Number 10 of 
um, outrightly uh, made the point and, and denied that this happened. I am confident that Sue Gray had the freedom to write the report that she was comfortable to write and publish. OK. Uh, now, currently, 34 uh, MPs have publicly questioned the Prime Minister's uh, position. Conservative MPs, this is. 24 are calling for him to go as soon as possible. That's according to the sort of Sky News spreadsheet that's been meticulously, meticulously kept by our producer, uh, Tom Larkin. Do you think that the Prime Minister is going to face a confidence vote? I don't think he will, actually. I don't think it's in the interest of the country. I don't think it's in the interest of the Conservative Party. And obviously, I'm somebody who was chairman of the party through the last uh, Prime Minister, having not only a confidence vote, but I was the chairman who ran that leadership campaign. So uh, I've seen this from both sides. I don't think it's in anybody's interest. No, I don't think we will see that happen. The reason that I'm asking is because, obviously, you know, 24 calling from him to go is still quite below the 54 needed to trigger a vote of no mm. confidence. But as you all very well remember, when the confidence vote was triggered in Theresa May, the number of people who had letters in was roughly double the number who'd said publicly uh, that they had had done so. Well, first of all, let's be clear, that's, that's rumour and supposition. Nobody knows how many letters are in. But one thing I do know from having been chairman of the party, I worked obviously closely with Graham Brady because you run the leadership campaign between what's called the 1922 committee and the party. Um, and what I do know is there's only one person who knows how many letters are in, and that is Graham Brady. That's never leaked. I doubt it ever will leak. Um, and so anybody who's debating what the numbers were back then or are today but is it's, pure supposition. But isn't that the point, right? That we don't actually know how many letters mm. are in, and so it actually could be a lot higher... Uh, than we think. And well, it could could also, be, the look, number could be hit. But it could also be lower. Look, for example, you talked about the fact that we've got the Sky News list of who has said different things out there. I can remember a few months ago, um, one of your reporters at Sky News saying that I hadn't supported the Prime Minister because I hadn't tweeted, missing the fact that I was the first minister out on TV supporting the Prime Minister. So, look, these lists are there. People have their things that they'll say publicly. I can remember as a, as a relatively new MP after David Cameron came into government as Prime Minister in, I think it was about 2011, 2012, we had people writing and saying they'd written letters in back then. This is something that does happen. I wish it didn't. I think we should all be focused on getting on with the job. I know in dealing with the Prime Minister, both on Northern Ireland issues and more widely in Cabinet, that his focus, rightly, is on getting things done for people in the United Kingdom, particularly at the difficult point we're at where people are facing such financial challenges. A difficult point that's reflected in some of the polling, and we've got this YouGov um, MRRP poll, it's the same model that predicted the general election results. And this has shown the Conservatives would lose all but three of the 88 <coughs> battleground seats that you held, hold by a slim margin over Labour. When you saw that, how did you feel? As I've always done with polling, and I've probably said this on your show before, that polling is a snapshot. And first of all, we've got a, a fair way to go. There's not a general election in the next few months. It's, you know, could well be a fair way months. away. <laughs> well, it could be a fair way away. And actually, there's a lot of work we are doing to deliver for people. And I hope by the time we get to that general election, people will see two, two key things. One is that we have delivered. The Prime Minister has got those big calls right. And they'll see a manifesto that's exciting about the future. But one other thing I would just say that is important on polling. It is a snapshot. I can remember in the 2015 general election, two or three days before polling day, a poll came out that told me I was losing my seat to Labour. My majority actually went up. So we have to remember that, you know, these polls are a snapshot. The work we do as parliamentarians, as campaigners, can make a very, very big difference. And I still think we will win the next general election. And I think that's in the best interest of the country. It's interesting when you said that a general election won't be for the next few months. Is that an acknowledgement that it could be a bit earlier than uh, we're expecting? No, no, I just mean this is a poll as of today. It's a snapshot of where we are today. But even if it was a snapshot of today, even if the general election was next Thursday, we've had elections before where the polls have been proven to be out. And as I say, I give that example in my own constituency, three or four, two or three days before polling in one election, told me I was going to lose by a fair few percent and, in fact, my majority went up. So Boris Johnson will be hoping the same because he's down to lose his seat. Well, and actually, if well. you remember, going into 2019, there were reports that the Prime Minister was going to lose his seat and that didn't prove to be the case. You know, he's a good uh, Member of Parliament. I think he's a superb Prime Minister. And if you look at these big decisions, whether it's Ukraine or through Covid, he has got them right. And I think that is what we need in our okay. country. Uh, now, on Friday, Boris Johnson amended the rules of the Ministerial Code to make it clear that ministers won't always be expected to resign for breaching it. And before um, doing this programme I, on Twitter, I asked if there's any questions that people would like to ask. And I know Twitter is, you know, Twitter, but still. Uh, I was quite surprised, actually, because this subject came up more than any other. 
Andrew Simmons. He wants you to explain Johnson's rewriting of the forward to the ministerial code. Do honesty, integrity, transparency matter anymore? He's referring to the Prime Minister removing uh, those words uh, from uh, the forward. Colm Norton, it would be nice to hear a cabinet minister answer a question and with the new ministerial rules, he wouldn't even have to resign for doing so. Um, why is the Prime Minister trying to water down parliamentary standards? Uh, well, he's not. Look, let's remember, there's been a bit of misinformation out there about this. First of all, when the ministerial code is updated, which it is relatively regularly, I'm one of those who obviously has to fill in um, all of the members' uh, ministerial um, uh, declarations, and that's updated regularly as well. So whenever it's, it's updated quite regularly anyway, but this comes from the recommendations from the, from the Commission and some of it from Lord Guide around what there should be, and this idea of there being a graduated penalty process. Uh, people still have to resign if they uh, commit uh, uh, um, uh, misleading the House or something serious, but there, there was a request from, uh, from others, including Lord Guy and the, and the Commission, that we actually do have this kind of graduated approach. So it means that if there's a minor infraction, whereas before there may be a decision if there was a minor infraction, in theory that that's too minor to resign, then there's no penalty. There are now a series of penalties for different infractions if anybody creates, commits an infraction in the first place. Labour are calling a vote uh, on whether ministers who commit serious breaches of the ministerial code should have to resign. In other words, they're effectively forcing Conservative MPs to put their name uh, to these changes. It's going to feel quite uncomfortable, isn't it? A bit reminiscent of uh, Owen Paterson, perhaps. Um, how are you going to be voting? Uh, well, obviously, I look at the details of what the vote is because these things, the wording of these can be quite important. But look, to me, this feels like just Labour politicking over this. They're just playing games when actually what we should be doing is focusing on the issues that matter. Not the internal naval gazing at Westminster, but actually getting on with helping people. As we did this week, the massive announcement from the Chancellor around the support for people who are struggling with those, that global inflation challenge, uh, making sure we're putting the support in there. As we are in Northern Ireland at Belfast with the in-laws coming out of Tarleys to support people in Ukraine in these other issues, whether it's repairing, making sure the money's there for local authorities to repair the potholes that drive people crazy every day, or the bigger issues that are affecting their pocket and their families. That's what they want to see government and parliament focused on, I think. Talking about the, um, talking about the measures announced by the Chancellor, he also announced an energy profits levy uh, mm. on uh, oil and gas companies, what most of us, I guess, would call a windfall tax, but we can't use that term uh, for the Conservative Party for obvious reasons. Now, you previously said a windfall tax sounds attractive, but it doesn't work. Have you quite conveniently changed your mind there? Uh, no, I haven't actually. Look, I'm a, I believe in a low tax economy. And what I was, the point I was making was that what Labour predict, what were asking for was a straight windfall tax that disincentivised um, uh, investment from companies, actually would worry companies in other sectors. And it Although, didn't put... actually, some companies like Shell have said that your policy is well, going to discourage okay, let me investment just, as well. Yeah, I don't know, I've seen that, but let me ju just finish the point. And it also meant very, very little money actually to go into people's pockets to help them. One of the things that was clear once we, we, we dug into this, the Labour's claims were completely false. What the Chancellor's outlined is different. Uh, first of all, I, I doubt many Conservatives are comfortable with taxes of any sort. We want to see a low-tax economy, more people in people's pockets to drive growth. But we are in unprecedented times. And I've said before, actually, as we went through COVID, we were there to to help people and I think our track record is in unprecedented times with a difficult situation where we do what we can to help. And what the Chancellor's outlined is different because the Chancellor's structure, yes, it does put that profit levy on, it's temporary, uh, it means much more money coming back to help people, but he's also put in a tax break that means that if those companies do what they were meant to be doing, yeah. which is investing, yeah. then they get the tax benefit that balances this out. So it's not exactly, it's not a windfall tax in the sense that Labour put in. It's a much more structured, targeted approach that can drive drive investment, which we need in that sector, but also help people with the challenges they're facing with the cost of living due to global inflation pressures. You're talking about um, wanting to focus on the things that matter uh, to people. Um, the story that uh, the Conservative Party pushing today is about imperial measurements, you know, this kind of classic, you know, story uh, that seems to come around every six to months to a year. Now, Alicia Kearns, uh, the Conservative MP, has tweeted this morning to say, not one constituent ever has asked for this. This isn't a Brexit freedom. It's a nonsense. Uh, well, I have to say, in my constituency, I've had a different response. I've already had people pleased about it. And as you said, this is something that comes up regularly through the years. People, there are people who uh, want to go back and have that. But I'm I mean, of it an comes age, up regularly look, because the government say they're going to do it. I mean, eight well, months ago, just... tight the times, Boris Johnson is to announce the return of imperial weights and measures. That was eight months ago. He's doing look, it again look, today. This is, you know, it, this is in a week where, as I say, we've done some major legislation for Northern Ireland. We've done major announcement uh, to help people with the cost of living. You know, one of the biggest in, um, 
um, structural things we've done financially for a very long time, another £21 billion pounds of support to help people. And yes, look, there is something in there that's more light-hearted in terms of imperial measurements, something people like. Look, I'm of an age where I still think in my brain in two ways. I will sometimes talk in metres, I'll also talk in feet, uh, litres and pints, so miles and kilometres. And this just gives people the freedom and for businesses, and there are sectors out there. I know in my constituency, some of the, the market traders and the vegetable traders, as well as some of the pubs, will be pleased to be able to go back to those imperial measurements. We're just saying, you now have a choice. And now we've left the EU, we can do that. Yes, it's one of the smaller things we can do as we've left the EU, and there are other bigger things we can do, we want to do, but it's an indication we now have the freedom to make these decisions ourselves. Just finally, because we are at a time, um, how concerned are you about the scenes that we saw outside the Champions League uh, final last night? Uh, Liverpool supporters saying they were tear-gassed. Uh, yeah, look, I heard some of this last night. I think it is concerning. I think we do need to ensure that they are looking into how this happened. It's not the first time we've seen this overseas, actually, and we're very lucky here in the UK. We've got a police force who have specialism in this area. They're very, very good at it, and we've got to learn a, a, a little bit about what happened over there, get to the bottom of it, but it is concerning to see that people either didn't get into the stadium or were treated in the way that they, some of them seem to have been treated with a very aggressive approach. Liverpool want to see an investigation. Do you think that would be a good idea? I, I think I can understand that. I think we will all want to get to the bottom of how this happened, particularly as it's not the first time in the last years. When I was police minister, I remember overseas, a similar situation. Uh, and we've got to make sure that around the world we are using the expertise that is there in how to manage policing and the security around, uh, around football matches, particularly. Okay. So you think perhaps the French police need a bit more training? In well, I'm sure that the French will want to be looking into this mm. themselves. It's not for me to get involved in uh, their domestic affairs, but look, I can understand why people want to get to the bottom of this. And I think all of us, as you know, UK citizens who were there, will want to know that things were done correctly, and if they weren't, how we learn the lessons and how we all around the world know how we can police and keep people safe at big sporting events. OK, thank you very much uh, indeed, Brandon Lewis, uh, on the programme this morning. Well, the Chancellor's announcement of new measures on the cost of living that we were just discussing uh, there is a potentially difficult moment for Labour. They'll feel, of course, they forced that U-turn on a windfall tax. The £15 billion package of additional support, though, especially targeted at lower earners, has been widely welcomed. So what would Labour do differently? We're joined now by the party chair and shadow women and equalities secretary Annalise Dodds. Thank you very much for being on the programme uh, with us. Um, I'll get to, you know, the Labour policies in a minute, but we've just heard from Brandon Lewis. He he says he's got full confidence in the Sue Gray uh, report, despite the allegations uh, in the Sunday Times this morning. Uh, do you? Well, I have to say the one person that sadly we don't have confidence in is the Prime Minister. We now know because of that report that he repeatedly lied to Parliament and his response, as we've seen over the last just couple of days, has been to try and actually change the rules that he will then be judged by because he's seeking to water down the ministerial code. That's the big issue here and that's what Labour's focused on because for as long as we have Boris Johnson at the head of government currently, we actually aren't seeing many of the big issues being gripped onto by the Conservatives. That government continues to be in chaos and ultimately working people are paying the price. At the same time, though, you're talking there about how Boris Johnson has tried to you know, change the ministerial code that he'll be judged by. It is important to say, though, isn't it, that the most serious offences, so misleading Parliament, the, what jo Boris Johnson has been investigated for, that would still be a resignation issue. So he wouldn't necessarily benefit himself from the changes that he's making. Well, unfortunately, he has not resigned. I mean, ultimately, that is a sanction that's in the existing found code, guilty yet, has he? He has not applied it... Well, I think most people would draw their own conclusions, frankly, seeing what's in... It'd be a bit strange for him to resign before the investigation's completed, wouldn't repeated it? Denials. Well, um, ultimately, I think you're seeing many Conservative MPs themselves having taken that decision. Not enough of them, I would say. But when it comes to the reform of the Ministerial Code, you know, I think the difference is very, very clear. You've got Boris Johnson having removed the words integrity, accountability, honesty, even from the foreword to that code. As I say, he has watered down the sanctions. It used to be previously the case 
that any breaking of the ministerial code would be a resignation issue. Now, there are other sanctions that have been put in there, even just apologising, where surely that would be the very first thing that we would expect. That's not a sanction. That's just what ministers should do as a function of course if they're found to have broken the rules. So we will be forcing a vote on this. We think that ultimately politics should be clean. They should be a force for good. We should have all politicians held to high standards. That's why we're calling for that vote. OK. Uh, I'm keen to talk a little bit about the cost of living uh, crisis because we saw, uh, as I said in the introduction to you, we saw the Conservative response uh, this week uh, and it was widely welcomed. You know, the IFS called it a big expensive package which is hugely redistributive, taking from high earners and giving to the poor. The Resolution Foundation said it rightly prioritises those hit hardest by the cost of living crisis. You must welcome the action that's been taken. Well, of course, after five months of calling for that windfall tax, finally, we are relieved that the government appears to have listened, at least on that subject. But we are concerned that there doesn't seem to be any plan now to deal with the causes of that cost of living crisis. Yes, some action to deal with its symptoms that we've called for, as I said, for many months, but not action to deal with its causes. I mean, again, Labour's called for many, many months now for a home insulation programme that would take £400 off people's bills, not just this year, but in subsequent years into the future as well. Again, the other measures that we need to see being taken for our energy security. Labour's called, for example, for a doubling of onshore wind, for a tripling of solar and for an end to the government's delay on new nuclear. We need those measures to be taken urgently because they will deal with the causes of some of this cost of living crisis and not just the symptoms. You know, it seems with this government, they tend to be dragged kicking and screaming to action at the last minute. We need to see those longer term plans now. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I do sometimes feel listening to Labour um, that you want the government to go a little bit more quickly uh, on things that it's already you know, doing. When it comes to nuclear, you're sort of saying that they want to speed it up. But the government has committed to a nuclear strategy. Uh, if the big idea is, you know, homes insulation, that's something that politicians have spoken about for an awfully long time. I mean, your head of Labour's policy review that was launched in June 2021, so it's been running for a year now, we're currently facing uh, an absolute cost of living crisis, inflation at a 40 year high, potentially the biggest drop in living standards since records began. What is the single transformative idea that you've come up with in this year-long policy review? Well, we've come up with many, many ideas. If people are particularly interested, they can look at our reports on the Labour website. And I have to say that the core idea for Labour is, right now, when it comes to that cost of living crisis, as I said, not just dealing with the symptoms. We set out that windfall tax policy. It took the government five months to contemplate it. They said that it was unconservative. They said they wouldn't enact it. They've been dragged kicking and screaming to put it into place. But we're saying, right, we've got to deal with those causes as well. You know, we just talked about yeah. energy security and Labour's plan there. Yeah, just but to come also, in, because I did ask you for the one... for growth. Sorry to interrupt. I did ask well, for I was the just one going to transformative say... <laughs> policy. What, what is it? Well, I was just going to, to say, and sorry, it is difficult when we're not in the same place, but I was going to say when it comes to growth, when we've had such low growth under Conservative-led governments compared to under uh, previous Labour governments, that we're very clear we've got to buy, make and sell more in our country. And that's what Rachel Reeves has been setting out. If we do that, then we can build growth back up again because we've had far too low levels of economic growth. That's holding back people's living standards and we've set out exactly how we would be delivering that. So it really is Labour that's the party of ideas now. The Conservatives have been dragged along in the wake of what Labour has been setting out there. And that's a big problem because people are right up against it right now and they need to see a government that's on their side. They don't have that at the moment. OK. Uh, I just want to move on to your women and equalities uh, brief to end. Uh, Stella Creasy, the Labour MP, said in an interview with Telegraph yesterday, do I think that women were born with penises? Yes. Do you agree with her? Um, well, no, I, I don't agree with her. Biological females um, obviously aren't. Of course, there are also uh, trans women who've made a transition in their gender, but sex is not the same as gender. But I would say that Obviously, I have a huge amount of respect for my colleague 
Stella Creasy. She's done a huge amount of campaigning for women. But on that issue around biology, um, I do have a, a different opinion. Um, it's interesting, this debate, and, it, you know, the, the last thing you want to do is just to kind of try and get the kind of shock questions or anything like that in. But there is a genuine debate that's being had uh, on what trans policy means uh, more widely. Suella Braverman, the Attorney General, uh, gave an interview with The Times this weekend where she was speaking about how schools should accommodate trans pupils. And, of course, this is a live debate. You know, the Education Secretary is drawing up guidance uh, on single-sex spaces. So she was asked whether pupils who are born male... Uh, should be able to use girls' lavatories or changing facilities. And she said, I would say to the school that they don't have to and that they shouldn't. They shouldn't allow that child to go into girls' toilets. I think protecting single-sex spaces for biological females and biological males is really important, particularly in schools. What's your position on that? Well, of course, it was Labour that created the Equality Act that provides the legal background for those single-sex spaces where they're needed. But I have to say, I find this incredibly frustrating. I mean, as you mentioned, the government said that it would produce guidelines to help schools, to help teachers on these issues. They haven't produced those guidelines. Instead, you've got ministers who are taking up their time talking about these different issues, sounding off on them, not providing those guidelines. And quite frankly, our Attorney General, when she's presiding over such low levels, record low levels of prosecutions for rape and actually making the situation worse now by allowing actually the notes from counselling sessions for rape victims to be used to attack the credibility of those victims. I think she should get a grip on that issue and focus on it. And ultimately, if she's concerned about the situation in schools, she should be getting her education colleagues to hurry up and produce the guidelines that they said they would provide, because all children, all children need to be safe in school. OK, thank you uh, very much indeed. Annalise Dodds uh, there. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the RMT union has vowed to bring the country to a standstill as railway workers voted overwhelmingly for strike action across the network. It could mean the biggest railway stoppage for decades with action across network rail and 13 train companies. The timetable could be just 20% of normal. Now, it's a sign of the worsening industrial relations across the econ economy as workers seek big pay rises given the record rate of inflation. Well, Mick Lynch is the General Secretary of the RMT and joins us now. Thank you very much for being uh, with us here in the studio. Um, so you've told The Telegraph you're going to be striking from the north of Scotland down to the tip of Cornwall. Why do you want to see strike action? We don't want strike action. This is a defensive action against the companies and the government, in fact, who are bringing in stringent cuts, thousands of jobs of our members, some thousands have already gone, and there's thousands more to go. They also want to completely change the conditions that our members have agreed with their employers. And... We haven't had a pay rise for a very long time. Many of our members are now in the third anniversary of not having a pay rise. They worked all the way through COVID. Uh, they mainly had to work at work, not uh, staying at home, working online. And they're fed up with it. They want to have job security. They want to provide a service for the public. But we do need a pay rise to keep up with the rocket in inflation that we're all experiencing. You say that you need a pay rise. Um, the average UK salary is £31,000. The average railway salary is £45,000. No, that's not correct. Well, what's the correct number? The median salary for a railway worker that we represent is £31,000. It's exactly in line with the average. Um, so, but given the fact that, you know, it is in line with the average, um, why some people, you know, look at watching and listening to this will be wondering why it is that you do deserve a, a pay rise ahead of others? Well, all British workers deserve a pay rise. There's a bit of a nonsense that goes around, especially in the media, that says if we get a pay rise, somehow other workers uh, won't get a pay rise, or if we don't get a pay rise, it will be transferred to nurses, to, to other public sector workers and people that are also being exploited. That just won't happen. If we don't get a pay rise, the profits of the companies will just go up. And what needs to happen in the UK is that some of these profits need to be reduced so that British workers can get... Pay rise. Every worker in this country is struggling at the moment. They can't keep up with the utility prices. They can't keep up with their household bills. We need a pay rise, but we also need job security because there's a lot of precarious work and vulnerable work at the moment, and that's got to end. If you're saying that everyone deserves a pay rise, are you not worried about the impact that this could have on inflation, which is, you know, the very thing that everyone's really concerned about? You know, the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey calling for pay restraint because it could... Well, his pay restraint, he's on £600,000 a year as is the Chief of Network Rail. There are railway bosses taking home millions of pounds every year. The railway's made £500 million 
of profit last year when uh, fares and passengers were at an all-time low. People are stripping money out of the railway. They're stripping money out of the economy. And if workers' wages don't go up, it means a transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. We've got more billionaires than we've ever had in this country. The rich have never been richer. And the reason they're able to do that and get richer all the time is because they're deliberately depressing workers' wages. Inflation has come on board now and virtually nobody's had a pay rise for the last two or three years. So this idea that there's a wages price spiral is nonsense. I totally get, um, and I'm sure many of our viewers will, will share, you know, your assessment of the very, very high uh, wages, particularly the high wages of those people calling for pay restraint. Uh, but it doesn't change the facts, though, does it? That if, if lots of people get pay rises, then it could lead to inflation. Well, inflation is already here. And but nobody's it could had lead a to more inflation, right? Well, it could lead to more inflation, but what could also stop inflation is that some of the companies could restrain their profits and return that money into lower prices. BP and Shell and the others are making record profits of billions of pounds every quarter, never mind yearly. They don't, they've got so much money they don't know what to do with it. One of the things they could do is sacrifice those profits, never mind a windfall tax. What about a dividend that goes back to the people that are consuming their, their materials? But also, we've got thousands and thousands, if not millions of people who are struggling and while they're working are having to take benefits. That's an outrage. The reason they have to take benefits is they're not being paid enough and they need to be paid more. OK. Uh, now, just talking about the strike action, do you think it's now inevitable? Well, we're talking to the companies. We're talking to the companies at a very senior level, but they are taking a very hard line. They want to impose these cuts while they're imposing record increases in fares. Their uh, fare increases are linked to the retail price index, so, so the, but our the, wages aren't. The question is, do you think the strikes are inevitable? I can't see a way out from the strikes at the moment, unless there's a breakthrough, unless the government instructs these companies, which they are doing, to, ch to change their line rather than harden their line, it's very, very likely that there'll be strike action and it'll be very soon. And what, what level of pay increase would you like to see for your members? Well, I'll negotiate that with the companies. There's lots of ways to put value into a package. But just but, give us a rough idea. Well, we want to see something that reflects the ever-increasing costs. Our anniversaries for these companies were back in December and back in uh, April. So does that mean you'd like to see it roughly the same level as, as inflation? Well, it needs fair? to meet the aspirations of our members, which coincide with inflation, yes. So roughly around the, the level that inflation currently is? Well, that's what so they need eight, to do eight, to keep eight, up. To Otherwise, our people become poorer. 8 to 10%. Well, we'll talk to the companies about that. OK. Uh, now, millions of people across the country are gearing up to make good use of the extra bank holidays to celebrate the Queen's mm. Jubilee. Um, and yet there are planned strikes on the London Underground. Well, you... there's not. We've called off a strike next Friday. We've got a, a way forward on that, which is on one of the public holidays. So there's no strike action by the RMT over any of the Queen's Jubilee oh, celebrations. On both the June the 3rd and June the 6th? Well, June the 6th is after the celebrations. OK, but it's still on the bank holiday, though, isn't it? Well, the bank holiday is Thursday and Friday. This is a normal work day on the Monday. OK, right, so you've... <laughs> all right, OK. That's where we are. So you've, so you've, 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 you've called off one of the strike actions, but how, how, how worried are you about the disruption that it could cause people and the sympathy that you might get? Well, we don't want disruption. It's a hard road being a trade unionist and taking industrial action, but we feel we have no choice. The London mayor is attacking our people. He's attacking their pensions. He wants to make them poorer permanently, not just while they're at work, but while they're in retirement. It's exactly the same agenda that the government's putting forward through these funding negotiations with the companies and with the London mayor. We cannot sit idly by as a trade unionist while our, while our people are being attacked while they're at work, while they finish, when they finish work for retirement, and the very threat that they may lose their jobs. It's my job as a trade union leader to defend our people. And this is a defensive strike, if it happens. Their tanks are on our lawn. We're not threatening them. They're threatening our people. You're looking ahead to the summer. Do you think we could see, you know, a summer of discontent? Well, there are a lot of workers that are very upset. I'm, I'm seeing that there's action going on in the local councils. We've got refuse workers. We've got care workers. Most people who come from traditional working class environments find themselves super exploited. Not only have they got poor wages, they've got poor conditions, if they've got any conditions, but they also find themselves under the threat of cuts, uh, and that being job cuts. So there has to be a response from all of the trade unions and from the TUC. And, and we would sort of like to see the Labour Party and its leadership come in behind working class people so that they ensure they get a pay rise, so there's some support from the politicians as well as from the trade unions. Well, and this, you... is, this is a measure for Keir Starmer, so that he can decide whether he's on the side of the workers in this country or on the side of the bosses. Do you think that he hasn't made that clear, then? He hasn't made it clear at all. I've not heard him say once 
uh, during the current dispute, such as at the Co Coventry uh, Council, where the, the Labour Council sought to cut workers' wages and cut their conditions. I've seen no response from the Labour front bench that says we support the workers in their struggles. And that is the role of a Labour party. The name gives it away, that they're, support, they're there to support the Labour movement. Do you think that Keir Starmer's on the side of workers? I can't see it at the moment. Wow. And so what do you think that means for the, you know, the funding of the Labour Party and the union support for the Labour Party? Well, my union's not affiliated to the Labour no. Party, but I see many other unions, general secretaries and leaders, thinking, what is the point of this connection? If we just get this bland democratic party sitting in the centre of uh, politics, taking their, their instructions off the Daily Mail to some extent, and not actually getting behind workers' struggles, you'd have to ask yourself, why do they call themselves the Labour Party? So we need to see a strong line. The Labour Party needs to get back into working class communities, support better wages, and support the end of precarious work, which is outsourced, subcontracted, and vulnerable work, where you don't know where you're going to get your next week's work from, in terms of these flexible hours contracts and zero hours contracts and all the rest of it. So they have to make a stand for working people. I mean, I guess what Keir Starmer would say uh, is that he's looked at the last uh, election results when there was a more left-wing leader uh, and it was a catastrophic set of results uh, for the Labour Party and that it's hit up to him to try and re-engage with some of those people who turned away from Labour. Yeah, some of those people that have turned away from Labour are the people who have not got any decent job security in this economy. Now, if he wants to go back to the red wall and now the blue wall, he's got to make a connection with working people. And one of those things is about the fact that there's no decent housing being built by councils, the fact that people cannot rely on an income, and the fact that they're underpaid. And this is a crisis, and it's time for Keir Starmer to stand up for our people. OK, just uh, finally, um, you have previously said that you can't rule out four-day uh, strikes. Are you concerned about what a four-day strike could look like uh, for this country? So, you know, for example, <coughs> you know, if they could lead to even the lights going out because of a disruption to services, Drax Power Station in North Yorkshire servicing millions of homes, and there's only a certain amount uh, of, uh, it, of, of, of power that it can stockpile. Are you concerned? I'm about concerned what that about disruption. I don't want disruption, and nor do my members, but they don't want to see their conditions stripped out, and they don't want to live under an ever-present threat of job cuts. Network Rail have already announced that 2,500 of my people will be made redundant. They've already made 1,500 job cuts in that company, and that's the first instalment. Now, we're going to see a stripped-out, dehumanised railway, if we're not careful. If the companies want to come back to the table and work with us to get a proper settlement, we can do that very quickly, and there wouldn't need to be any strikes at all. Do you think it genuinely could lead to the lights going out? I've got no idea. It depends how long the strike goes on, if there is strike action. And it's up to the government to give a mandate to the companies that they can settle this dispute. How long could the strikes be? They could go on for a very, very long time, because there's no sign at the moment that anybody's backing down on their side of the table. I mean, does they that are mean pushing... days, weeks? What... Well, we'll decide that as we go. We want to make the strike action, if it happens, as effective as possible from our point of view. But just you are prepared to strike for long enough that it could affect the power supply if you don't get you to have your demands met? Is that... Our members are prepared to take effective strike action in pursuit of a settlement of this dispute. I've got no idea how long that will take. And I can't determine from here what the, what the outcomes and side effects of that will be. OK. Um, doesn't sound like uh, you're ruling that out at all. Uh, thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Mick Lynch there, or the RMT. Thank you. Now, Iceland is well known for selling low-cost frozen food and it's popular among shoppers on lower incomes. But in a sign of just how tough things are, the supermarket is losing customers to food banks. That's people, of course, who can no longer afford to buy what they need to eat. The Chancellor has unveiled a new package of measures that the Treasury says is worth some £1,200 to those on lowest, the lowest incomes. But is it enough and just how much worse could things get this winter? Well, we are joined uh, now by Richard Walker, who is the Managing Director of Iceland. Um, can you just talk to us a little bit about, you know, the typical Iceland shopper and how difficult they're finding things now? Well, the reality is there is no uh, typical Iceland shopper. Averages don't work very well because we have people who, who come in and spend five quid and people who come in and, and spend 50 quid. Um, but yeah, I'm, generally, I think it's safe to say that everyone is, is feeling the pinch now. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, now, we, we do serve um, some of the poorer demographics around the country. And we are hearing stories, as you said, of 
some um, some of our custom disappearing to, to food banks, which is a reality, or indeed some customers um, when they're at the till asking the cashier when it amounts to 40 quid uh, so that they can leave the rest of their shopping. Um, we're seeing uh, people trading to the best value um, packs and, and products. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's fair to say that everyone's feeling the pinch, but certainly the harder pressed communities are, are feeling it more than anyone. Yeah, it really does paint a picture of uh, just how difficult so many people are finding it. And of course, inflation, a big concern over the board, but grocery price uh, inflation uh, in particular, a real worry. It's a hit at a 13 year high. Um, can you just give us a bit of a sense about what specific foods are, are rising by and how much? Yeah, um, again, it's, you know, there's there's no one particular metric. What's interesting about the, that food inflation figure, um, the, the median kind of food inflation figure of seven, eight percent, um, it includes things like champagne and legs of lamb. Um, now, <laughs> some of our customers certainly aren't buying that. And um, the reality is that, you know, the basic staples are increasing more. We've seen, as you'll know, a loaf of bread, which is now pound ten. It probably was about 89p. Uh, milk uh, across all retailers has, has gone up uh, quite dramatically. It's across the board. And that's because there's a perfect kind of maelstrom of inflationary pressures from commodity um, price increases uh, through to labour shortages. Shortages in in the fields uh, and factories, um, through to the price of fuel to uh, to move goods around, uh, through to genuine supply shortages like um, uh, sunflower oil um, or, or wheat, and both of which come from Ukraine, and and for obvious reasons, you know, uh, both of those uh, things have have dried up. And the unintended consequences of that, it's not just a bottle of sunflower oil or the wheat in your bread. Um, sunflower oil finds its way as a vegetable fat into hundreds of, of different uh, ready meals and pre-prepared meals, uh, and wheat goes into animal feed. Uh, so that is having a knock-on consequence of the price of, of everything from bacon to chicken. It's interesting you're talking there about Ukraine. Um, the Prime Minister and um, President Zelensky spoke just a couple of days ago about the impact of the blockage of the port of Odessa and the supply of, of grain around the world. Um, just looking forward, how concerned are you about the impact uh, that this could have and how much do you think food could actually go up by in the months ahead? Look, um, you know, there's people far cleverer than me who are, who are forecasting this stuff. Um, I, I think it's impossible to say. I think from where we are at the moment, I'm not gravely concerned around supply issues. Uh, I, and I think if you look at our own business, we are especially resilient as a, a frozen first retailer. Um, we, we can build up stocks. We have uh, long uh, supply lines, which, um, which we've been working on two years worth of shelf life. So we're, we're very resilient. And as a private family business, we can invest in the right places for our customers. And that's why we're doing a ton of different offers and deals and promotions and value packages just to try and help through our customers. Customers. Um, last week, for example, on, on Tuesday, we ran our first over 60s discount of 10%, uh, which was unbelievably well received um, by our, our um, some of our customers. Um, we've held the price of all of our one pound lines to the end of the year. That's a major investment by us because the price, the cost of those goods have, have gone up. So we're making no money on those now, but we think it's the right thing to do. Um, we've reduced the threshold of our home delivery because that service is more important than ever for people who can't afford to drive into town centres and spend the, the money on fuel um, and, and rather to take the free home delivery service. So there's loads of different things that we can do. It's certainly not going to get any easier. I don't know how, how much worse it's going to get, um, but hopefully uh, ourselves and our competitors are, are resilient enough to, to get through it for our customers. Yeah, certainly some concerning times uh, ahead. Uh, the government unveiled its big support package mm. uh, this week to help families. Is there anything specifically that you would like to see the government do going forward to try and help tackle you know, the rising cost of food? Do you know what I must say? You know, I think the government, the Chancellor in particular, has um, has really uh, stepped up and 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 uh, you know pulled the right levers. Uh, they already had over twenty billion pounds of of support before this additional twenty billion pounds of of latest packages. So certainly huge intervention there by the government. And actually, we've got to take a step back and realise that you know a lot of these pressures are global in nature and um, a, a lot of these pressures are outside of uh, the influence of of the government of the day or, or businesses like ours so i think they've they've 
they've done plenty actually for, for the general public and hopefully it will ease the pain and the burden as we get into the autumn as as um, inflation may peak and um, there's a ton of stuff I'd, I'd like him to do for business um, I don't know how he's going to afford it um, or we're all going to pay for it um, but I think at the moment they're, they're doing a good job. Thank you uh, very much really interesting uh, to talk and get your perspective and to hear some of those uh, stories about how shoppers are coping. Thank you. Thank you. Now to Ukraine. And when Vladimir Putin's forces first invaded her country, Kira Rudik's first thought was no Pilates today. Well, then she went into Parliament and she voted to create martial law as the country plunged into war. Oh, and then she went to pick up a rifle. She says that military training is a good workout, but putting bullets into guns ruins the manicure. The Ukrainian MP is in the UK at the moment. She's meeting politicians here. I'm delighted to say she joins us now. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, you know, Pleasure to be here. We've heard from a lot of you know, amazing Ukrainian women over the weeks, um, but you know, to actually meet somebody as they're travelling to the UK is a, you know, it is a privilege, so thank you. Thank you. Um, now, you're part of the resistance uh, in Ukraine. You know, as, as I said in the introduction, you, know, you kind of joked that training is, is a good workout, but it's not great for the manicure. You, you know how to shoot a gun. You've been training for two hours a day. Can you just talk a bit about your experience, your life must have completely changed since the announcement of war. Yeah, it absolutely changed. Uh, and the sad thing, it will never be the same again. You know, um, I was traveling right now, um, by the time pass, as Ukraine refugees do when they leave Ukraine. And everybody was so great along the way uh, in Poland and moving forward and here in the UK. Uh, so, uh, on the first morning, I was jogging in Warsaw and there was an ambulance passing by with wheel, wheel, wheel. And I realized that in one minute I'm on the ground with my head hovering my head. And so, for the last three months, I have been standing still, doing everything possible and impossible. I realized that the trauma that Ukrainian people are getting, that I'm getting, is something that that is there, that will never go away. This is what we are talking about when we are saying that uh, the trauma on our children in different ages would be something that is irreparable. And it's for generation right now. You know, like uh, we were hoping that we will uh, raise up all the children that uh, don't know the poverty, the war, the revolutions, that we would spoil them and make sure that they will be, uh, when they will be grown up, they will be able to build new advanced Ukraine. And right now we are robbed of that. And my life in Ukraine as politician, as a member of resistance, um, it's just completely different from anything I could have ever imagined. And what is it like? Can you give us an insight? Like, where, where are you living? What was a typical day? So I, I stay at home. Uh, I still have uh, resistance members staying with me. They are training and I'm training with them. Uh, we are training to shoot. We are training some, some uh, uh, advancements and how to protect the territory where we are. We are right now part of the major resistance uh, of Kyiv region and uh, some of the people have been already deployed to war. And some of the members of my team will also be redeployed soon. Um, I cook something that I never have done before. We still have uh, one month's supplies of food and water at home because it's so scary, you know, the scary thing was that there will be no water and I was uh, thinking, I don't want to die dirty. So I have like lots of water everywhere. I, I actually, to to yeah. <laughs> no, but this is something when you're talking to refugees from Kharkiv, from heavily bombarded areas, when they are saying, uh, well, like the, the most complicated thing was when the electricity went down, when the water went, uh, went off. So like, what are, you, what are you supposed to do? You have to get ready for everything. I have... Um, uh, so I have chargers and power banks everywhere and make sure that they are charged in case, uh, in case we will have to use them. So you live in this constant inability to exhale and say, OK, yeah, we are safe right now. Because every single day there are air raid sirens. There are attacks on Kiev and on other major cities of Ukraine, and the war, it did not go anywhere. The active fighting went to the east, but the threat, the fear, it is still there. As you said, that, that is a fear that 
you will always bear with you at, le at least. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's that's something that that is already with me, um, and I realize it so strongly right now. Um, do you think you'll ever feel safe again? Well, here I feel safe, but I'll have to come back home because this is the fight that we have to put up and we have to win. And I dream of the day when when all Ukrainians will be able to feel safe, when we will, you know, be able to sit, put your uh, hands on your lap and say, yeah, okay, we are okay now. And more important is that our children will be able to do so. Because right now, so yesterday I was at, at the protests at the Downing Streets, mm -hmm. at the rallies of Ukrainian people, and people say, we feel so uncomfortable that we had to leave. Mm -hmm. We feel so great that people are uh, supporting us, but we feel guilty that we had to leave. And I say, don't. No. You make sure that your children are not going through this terror, they are not going through this trauma, and you need to make sure that they are safe. And this is what your obligation as a parent, to make them safe. Mm -hmm. This is why I am telling to Ukrainian people, wherever you are, we are all together. We are standing together and we are supporting our country. And every single person is doing it their own way. Mm -hmm. And this is why uh, it's so important. This, this is why this trip is so important, that I was able to talk to them and to support them and to hear from them. Um, let's talk a bit about the, the visit. As you say, you've been meeting uh, politicians here in the UK. What is it specifically you've been asking for and if you had any reassurances? So uh, I'm having actually an important meeting with the Defence Committee tomorrow. Uh, and before that, there are three things that I'm actually asking for. The first one is the uh, wide range missiles. This is something that we critically need to make sure that we fight Russians back. You have heard that they have been advancing in the East and we do need more weapons and we need specific weapons that we know that will help us. The second point is uh, the uh, visa waiver for Ukrainians. There is, you know, U United Kingdom is very far from Ukraine. There are not so many people getting in. But for the ones who are, uh, I, I'm uh, humbly asking for making it easier on them. What, what is the process like? Is it too bureaucratic? We have it's heard these stories. It's too bureaucratic, it's long but... and, uh, and it's complicated. And these are you... refugees who might not yeah, have the Yeah, they don't have the them. paperwork, yes. And you see, like, um, Britain has been one of our closest allies. So Ukrainians right now travel without visas through the EU. Uh, there are, the processes have been eased up for US and Canada. So it's like just a question mark for me why the United Kingdom wouldn't do the same. It would be just only natural. And again, we are, we are talking about maybe 20,000 people who would get it eased up. So on them. So I think this is completely doable. And the third thing is, sorry about the ports. Mm -hmm. So before the war, Ukraine was top three producers of the world grains, sunflower oil, uh, wheat, tomatoes and corn. So tell me which ones you don't like, <laughs> which ones you don't want to <laughs> yeah. get rid of. And so right now it is all blocked in Ukraine and we are unable to, to actually deliver it anywhere because of the blocked ports. So there is an extreme need right now to get into humanitarian mission to be able to extract all this produce. I have talked to people here. I know you guys are having already uh, higher uh, food prices. Which we just talked about just the yeah. interview before. Sunflower oil is missing from the stores. You know why? Because it's all in Ukraine right now. And the world right now has only 10 weeks supplies of grains. 10 weeks for all the politicians, all the leaders of the world to make sure that we figure out how to, how to get all the harvest that Ukraine has out. So these are the three key points that I'm pushing, that I'm working on to make sure that, uh, that they actually make a real difference. So it's not a, like a political discussions, it's rather the executional discussions. Let's get on that and do that. It's interesting to listen to those three points. It feels like with two of those points, the UK government is very on board with. It, we've been one of the leading supplier of weapons. Uh, we know that Boris Johnson has spoken specifically to President Zelensky about the port situation. I guess, is it the middle situation, the, the visa requirement that you think the UK is doing the worst on? Of these three points, probably it's just like at the bottom of the list. Yeah. Because uh, as my argument that there is not too many people who need this waiver, and the government's argument as well is there is not too many people, like let them go through the process. Mm -hmm. But 
I met those people, I know them. They, they are all people who just are, uh, they just need the support. People are not coming to United Kingdom like, to, to get like support from the government. They usually come in here because they have relatives or they have friends or they have somebody to support. Do you think there's a reluctance with this government to, to open up the visa requirements? Uh, there is some. I think it's just like saying, OK, it's not in, in our priorities. And some that's why I yeah. can deal with it. Yeah. Well, I want to make it a priority. OK. Um, and just finally, um, you know, it's, it's always difficult talking about the specifics of what is happening in Ukraine. I find it difficult to, to listen to. I'm sure our viewers find it difficult to listen to as well. But there is an importance to, to bear witness and to for us to, to tell the world about what is happening. You know, you were speaking very movingly about children and the impact on children at the beginning of the interview. And I just wondered if you wanted to leave us with any examples of the kind of thing that children are experiencing in Ukraine. I can give a couple of examples. So at the very beginning of the war, in the bomb shelter, there was a toddler whose mommy told him his uh, blood type. So he's barely speaking, and when he's asked, what's your blood type, he's saying. There is a girl who was asking her mommy the question that nobody can answer for real. Mommy, are we refugees now? How are you supposed to, to talk to your kid about that? And there were these a uh, group of children, refugees from Mariupol, who were handed over like without their parents. And their parents were giving them the backpacks, the small ones, the blue for boys and the pink for girls. And they were putting uh, like the, the small bare minimum there. And when, and, and mommies, when they were handing them over to strangers saying, just get them safe, they were telling, hold on, well, no matter what happens, hold on to your backpack. And then when, at the refugee center, you are hugging this child and you are telling, like, give it to me, like, please, let's open up and watch what's there. And he's saying, no, mommy told me not to do that. Mommy told me to, to do this. And do, would I ever see my mommy again? And then when you open up, you know, like the same, same thing uh, probably that happened during the world, Second World War when they were writing down like the small things, like saying, mommy loves you. This is his last name, first name. This is his paperwork. This is our address. And please, 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 please make him safe. This is what I want for Ukrainian children, to make them safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the programme. So I'm very emotional. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard to hear face to face some of what's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that is it uh, for Sophie Ridge on Sunday uh, this week. What a moving uh, interview to finish with. Um, we really thank you for coming uh, on the programme and talking about that. Uh, Sophie Ridge on Sunday, the podcast, uh, will be available, of course, uh, later on uh, today. Uh, around lunchtime, that is usually available. Thanks for watching. See you next week.